Okay, going back to uh, uh, non non statistical mechanics. If we look at the change in entropy, okay, and for a reversible process, and we are imposing a closed system, okay, we could see that uh, well the uh, the first law of thermodynamics for a closed system with only expansion work as a possibility would be du is equal to TDS minus PDV. TDS stands for the heat because uh, we're saying it's reversible. And the PDV stands for the work uh, since we're saying it's only expansion work. And I can solve for DS and I would get uh, the, first, the first boxed equation. Okay, I also know that enthalpy is equal to this stuff of uh, uh, to dh is equal to du plus pdv plus vdp, uh, and so when that is uh, when that replaces the du, so when I put this dh directly, uh, sorry, when I put the du directly here for the dh, um, what will happen is the pdv will cancel itself out. And I will then retrieve another form of the ds with dh in it rather than du. Okay, so you can you can easily retrieve this by by substituting the bottom red into the top red, and you would receive this equation. And so these are known as Gibbsian the Gibbsian forms of uh, the entropy equation, uh, named after Josiah Willard Gibbs, who was a major uh, contributor to the field of thermodynamics. Uh, and so this is also the basis for uh, our discussion of how to evaluate entropy ourselves without using charts, without using uh, diagrams. Okay, so we're going to start with these in a, in a second. I'll show you what we're going to do. So this, these are the most general ones, and they are, they are fairly true, considering that DS itself is a state uh, variable. So you can use that for a variety of different processes. Uh, the problem comes in, uh, of course, in that it's hard to evaluate these without models. So let's apply models to them. So we're going to do ideal gas. Uh, we're going to do uh, incompressible um, incompressible fluids. Uh, and we're also going to do polytropic processes, and et cetera. We're going to see how th these things, uh, what, what happens to them. So um, I, am, I am replicating these two boxed equations at the top here here and here. And so these are two separate uh, derivations, but they basically arrive at the same idea for the delta S. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I'm gonna use ideal gas. So for the ideal gas, I know that du is equal to CVDT. So I put that in. And I also know that P over T using the PV equals RT equation, I know that P over T is equal to R over V. Okay, so this gives me this equation for the ideal gas. And then when I integrate this, I see delta S is the integral of CVDT. The integral of dV over V is the, is the natural log evaluated from V1 to V2. Uh, so it becomes ln of V2 of V1 uh, times R. Um, and then they have CV over T dT. So this is quite general. Uh, you can use in the back of the book, uh, when when there are, there are relations that uh, show uh, CV is a function of temperature, and uh, you can in, you can put them directly in there and evaluate this integral with that. If you were to assume that CV is temperature invariant, you could take that CV out, and you would get CV ln of T two over T one plus R ln of V two over V one. Okay, uh, all right. So similarly for the other Gibbsian uh, relation you can uh, derive quite similarly, you know, the dH is CPDT, you know, the V over T is R over P. So you get this. Uh, and then in the general sense, you get that same idea as before, the integral of CP over T dT and minus R ln of P2 over P1, because you know that this the integral of dP over P is ln of P and you evaluate that from P1 to P2. And again, when CV is temperature invariant, the C, the, I mean, it's, it's meant to say CP here, I'm sorry. When CP is temperature invariant, CP comes out and you get CP ln of T2 over T1 minus R ln um, P2 over P1. So we have two ways here uh, to evaluate the entropy change for an ideal gas. Um, 
with, with, depending on what variables you were given uh, and what assumptions you're making, okay? So it's more accurate to use these two. Of course, it's even more accurate to use these two, but because they don't assume ideal gas. But if you were to assume ideal gas, it's more accurate to use this in saying that CP and CV could, var could vary with temperature. And you can also even simplify it further this way. Okay. For an incompressible substance, uh, we've seen before that the specific heats are equivalent. And we also have seen that dV goes to zero. Okay, there's no change in volume, you can't compress them. Okay, so like water, you can apply all the pressure you want on it, the volume is going to change practically not at all. And so you can say that delta V is essentially zero when you compress it. So in that sense, if we look here, when the two volumes are the same, this term goes away right here. Okay, and so we could see it right here. So delta S in this scenario, this dV goes away. DU is just CDT for an, isen for an incompressible substance. Not doesn't have to be ideal, just CDT for that. And um, of course, if you assume that C is temperature invariant, you get C uh, times ln of T2 over T1. Generally, when I solve problems with an incompressible substance, I use CP data. Uh, again, CP and CV are the same for, for a liquid um, and for a solid. Uh, and we will see some examples where we apply this, for example, to a transistor or to say liquid water, whatever it is. Uh, and so we can assume that, that the, the C, uh, the CP is the same as the CV. Okay. Now let's discuss isentropic processes. And why do you care about isentropic processes? Who cares about those? Well, we've seen that isentropic processes are those where uh, things are reversible. Um, and we've seen when, when th things are reversible or adiabatic, we're going to get things that are isentropic with delta S is equal to zero. We've also discussed that isentropic processes are impossible, but they are nice limiting data, okay? So they give us some information as to the highest possible efficiency for a device or the highest possible efficiency for some flow. Okay, how much how much work can I derive from a fluid? How much work will it do for me? Uh, in the ideal sense, let's say it's ninety percent. I know that in for real, for real, when I do it, I will never attain ninety percent. Okay, but if I can get a kind of eke by towards like 80 percent, eighty three percent, I'm pretty happy because I know I'm getting to a, a, a maximal theoretical to a, to a theoretical maximum. Okay. Uh, another piece of information that would give me is if a device is supposed to uh, be at 90% according to an isentropic process, and I'm operating at 1%, then what I have is pretty crap, and I either have to replace it or fix it up or do something to make it more efficient. Okay, so it, it really gives a nice kind of idea. If you don't know what your maximum efficiency is or your maximum uh, or your limiting conditions are, then you don't have anything to compare it against. And you have no idea where you're operating. It's sort of like shooting in the dark. So it's a very, very important kind of uh, cap to have uh, when, when you discuss uh, things like uh, pumps uh, or, or compressors or you know, whatever, whatever you have, turbines, whatever you wish, uh, fans. And so uh, the, we, we routinely as engineers uh, try to characterize uh, pieces of, of equipment uh, using using isentropic processes, isentropic relations. So that's why we do that. So it, it may seem like a very pedagogical type of thing, like who cares why you're doing this? This is why we're doing it. It has an actual bottom line practical use. Okay. Uh, and then I also included this thing, which I thought was curious. I, have no, I know nothing about climatology, but apparently, what, which makes sense to me, when they study uh, storms or whatever, um, or, or, or large systems up uh, in the atmosphere, if they assume that there is very little interaction with the outside, they can discuss uh, using an isentrope how stable that system is. Okay, so again, it's like another limiting factor in that sense. If they kind of confine it and say DS is zero, it's not interacting, it's got a, re a reversible kind of thing, it's adiabatic, um, 
how stable is the storm? Is it going to break up? Is it going to go in, or is it, or is it really intense or whatever it is? It gives them climatological, climatological uh, information and they use it. Uh, and in general, um, I've never studied climatology, but I could tell you that from my experience and from my exposure to it, they heavily rely on thermodynamics to predict uh, weather, weather scenarios and weather conditions, which I think is fascinating. All right. Let's talk isentropic uh, analysis for ideal gases. And as a reminder, uh, we use the letter K to denote the ratio of CP over CV. That is unrelated to the, uh, it's un absolutely unrelated to uh, the ideal gas. It's just, the, it's just a, a ratio between CP and CV. Uh, what is specific to ideal gas is CP minus CV is equal to R. So this first relation, always true. Uh, everything else on this page is uh, for the ideal gas. Okay, so this is just a, a review that we've we've seen before when we're doing the first law and we're talking about polytropic things. Um, uh, for pop, for an adiabatic, when we talk about adiabatic processes, we were discussing this before. Um, we we've seen these relations, okay, and you've seen this, and I will sh you know if, if we discussed at some at some point, you can go back to my other lecture on this. Uh, you've seen these relations with the letter N instead of K. And when you see the letter N instead of K, it is a polytropic process, not an isentropic, just polytropic. Uh, and so you can have any sort of N for that. And you can get, this is the work of expansion for that. This is the relationship between the P's and the T's and what, what have you for an ideal gas, of course. Uh, when that exponent N happens to be CP over CV, then you can impose that it is adiabatic and you can impose uh, that uh, it is isentropic. And so um, when, we use, when you try to evaluate the work due to expansion of, uh, of an ideal gas at, uh, at the isentropic limit, okay, uh, you can use K, okay, and it's very important, I, I wrote that in red, uh, you can assume K to be constant even if the question or even if I told you that CP and CV are not temperature invariant. So if CP has a function with temperature and CV has a function of temperature, you can still assume that the ratio between them is somewhat constant and use these relations. So that's fine. But if you're trying to evaluate CP dt, use the full integral. But if you're just looking at K, it's okay to just look at the uh, at, at a constant uh, at a constant number value uh, for for K. All right, for an incompressible substance, okay, if you carry out this uh, the idea for an incompressible substance, what you will see, and as as we've saw, we've shown you here, for an incompressible substance, we said that delta S is equal to C ln of T2 over T1. And if you impose that it's isentropic, meaning that this goes away, the only, the only possible thing you could think, because C is not, C cannot be zero, the only way to make ln zero is by imposing that T1 is equal to T2. So for any liquid or anything that cannot be compressed, uh, if the process is isentropic, it is also isothermal. So for an for an ice for sorry for an incompressible substance, what you will see is that delta U and delta S and delta T all equal to zero. It's isothermal, it's isentropic, and it has no change in the internal energy. However, things do change for that system. So you can have a change in pressure, you can have a change in position, you can have a change in velocity, you can have a change in entropy, and other things. 